Good Monday afternoon, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and welcome to the I Love Seville show. Thank you kindly for joining us. We are live in Charlottesville, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world on the I Love Seville network. We're powered by the good folks at Tink Fiber Internet. We're presented by the best of the best here in the Charlottesville and Central Virginia community, Skuma Boutique Dispensary, located next to Rapture on the downtown mall is a boutique dispensary that's locally owned and operated by a dynamic husband and wife. And with certificates of analyses for everything in the store, Scuba Boutique Dispensary should be your choice for any CBD Delta 8 needs in our community. Scott Wagner, a part of the program. Scott Wagner, Integrated Medicine. Dr. Wagner has your back, undoubtedly. And if you look at the screen right now, you will see some of the best of the best of brands and businesses that are locally owned that make Charlottesville and such Virginia great. So much I want to cover today, including increased density in the city of Charlottesville. Yes, Flum, future land use map. This evening, front and center, Charlottesville City Council will have its first public hearing on the city's proposed and controversial future land use map, Esta Noche. Of course, this map would eliminate designations for exclusively single-family house neighborhoods, which creates the ability for increased density and different types of structures and neighborhoods in our 10.2 square mile city. We'll talk about that today on the I Love Seville show. I'm going to relay my grocery store experience and how sticker shock is something that is very real for those purchasing gallons of milk, loaves of bread, packs of bacon, bushels of wings, sliced cheese and just about any grocery imaginable in stores across the city, the county and central Virginia. We'll take a look and reflect on Notre Dame beating UVA football like a drum. Yes, the Fighting Irish beat our Wahoos like the little drummer boy. And I'll tell you, it wasn't pretty. And yes, it was on national television. And it really puts in perspective Brennan Armstrong's value to his football team. Virginia basketball got an important win over Radford, an in-state rival. And you saw in that Virginia basketball game, as three players hit double digits in scoring, led by Mr. Franklin, the uh, Indiana transfer, that when this team plays to its capabilities, Virginia basketball is a team to reckon with. The center, Shedrick, is a guy that has tremendous upside. He's long, he's quick, he can jump, he's physical, he's versatile. He reminds me of a leaner, more athletic, Jack Salt, who is more skilled in the post than Jack Salt. The transfers, Gardner and Franklin, one from ECU, one from Bloomington, Indiana, by way of the Indiana Hoosiers, are our two best players. Mr. Gardner and Mr. Franklin are two best players, are two best scorers, and, and it's, it's by a long shot. We're gonna need a third option and I'm not sure if that third option is Beekman. I'm not sure if that third option is Shedrick. I'm not sure if that third option is one of these guys that are coming off the bench. I mean, Cody Statman has had ample opportunity to prove himself in a Wahoo uniform, and he has not done that yet. Kia Clark, who's the heart and soul of this team, my wife's favorite player, one of my favorite players of all time, a guy who will live forever in the minds of Wahoo Basketball Nation as arguably the best assist maker in that game where he threw that dime to Mamadi Diakite. That pass, the greatest pass I think I've ever seen in a crunch time moment. Kihei, for all the props and praise we give him, and I am Kihei's number one evangelist. He's the heart and soul of the team. He's got hustle and chutzpah for days. But scoring, due to his limited stature, is not his cup of tea. A third option is going to have to rise to the occasion 
for this team to go deep in March. We'll take a look at Virginia basketball today on the program. Burger King, its parent company, has purchased Firehouse Subs for $1 billion. $1.1 billion to be exact. Burger King and its parent company, Restaurant Brands International, has purchased Firehouse Subs for over $1 billion. We'll take a look on that, how that could impact the Charlottesville and Central Virginia landscape today on the program. Johnny Ornalis, welcome to the program. Your comments, your thoughts, your praise. Welcome here on the I Love Seville Show. To begin the program, I want to talk what's happening tonight, esta noche, at Charlottesville City Council. The future land use map, and I'm going to give this to you in a very Cliff Notes version. It's a very complex issue. City Council is considering what is essentially an upzoning of the 10.2 square miles in the city of Charlottesville. And this upzoning would essentially eliminate designations for exclusively single family home neighborhoods. It would allow homeowners and it would allow the people who buy into the city of Charlottesville real estate game to pivot, evolve, change the houses they live in or the houses they purchase into different kinds of housing. Duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, cottages in the backyard, granny suites, in-law suites, an ADU to help offset the cost of mortgage. The, ca the thinking is if you increase the supply of rooftops into a city that has rooftop supply constraints, and Charlottesville certainly does, the additional supply will push down price points and make the jurisdiction more affordable. That's the thinking. More supply, same demand, prices go down. That's the thinking. Tonight, five people, three females, two men, Walker, Hill, McGill, Payne, Snook, will host a public hearing, the first, on the city's proposed and controversial future land use map. Now I'm going to give my thoughts, my opinions, my take, my perspective on this topic. I understand the reach we have. I understand the responsibility that comes with the reach that we have. And each day that I sit in this saddle, I am mindful of that responsibility. Everyone deserves an opportunity to purchase a whole. Now, not everyone is going to get a home that meets their criteria perfectly 10 out of 10 from a wants or needs or ask or hopes standpoint. And that's life. Some people want a Lamborghini. Some people want to play in the NBA. Some people want an estate in Keswick. Some people want to play pickleball and squash 24-7, 365, and not worry about anything else. Some people want to eat steak dinners with a side of loaded baked potatoes and wash them down with Minutemen IPAs from Dave Warwick and Three Notch and not worry about gaining any weight. Some people want their children to follow in the hobbies they have as parents 
so they can have those hobbies be more tangible from an everyday standpoint. We all have hopes and wants. Life says otherwise. That being said, the opportunity for home ownership, if you work hard and if you save money, we should have that shot of potentially buying a home. And it may not happen in our 20s or our 30s or maybe our early 40s, but eventually, if we work hard and we save money and we squirrel it away, we should have a shot at buying a crib, a house, a casa in the area we call home. And maybe that area, the radius, is a little further out than we would like. We have such limited inventory in the city, in Albemarle County, and frankly, much of central Virginia, that the cost of housing has escalated so quickly, it has many of us in the business comparing the area to San Francisco, to Palo Alto, to Greenwich, Connecticut, to Southampton, to Montauk, to East Hampton on Long Island, to the suburbs of New York City. And when you have an employer like the University of Virginia, when you have an institution like the University of Virginia, when you have infrastructure, educational, in place, like UVA, graduating students at prolific clips every year. Some of those students, talented, smart, intelligent, hungry, ambitious, wage earners of higher levels, will stay in this town and cannibalize the inventory every year from locals. For the most part, that's a good thing. That's how our economy stays strong. That's how your most prized possession in your retirement portfolio, your house, continues to grow in value. But from a negative or side effect or collateral damage aspect, that's how the community continues to be wealthy white and lacking diversity. So council, three women and two men, today in a public hearing, will determine or start to determine whether a future land use map that would eliminate designations for exclusive single family home neighborhoods which would allow opportunities for different kinds of housing to be added to these neighborhoods is the right path for our fair city. I asked this question today on Real Talk. In fact, one of the viewers did. And I asked it of Maggie Gunnels, of Christy Beck, and of Keith Smith through one of the viewers that watched Real Talk this morning. As rental prices escalate, does that, does that cause an increase in home values? And as home values increase, does that drive an escalation in rental prices? As homes get more expensive, what happens as homes get more expensive? The rental market gets more competitive. And why the rental market gets more competitive as homes get more expensive is because less people can afford to purchase a home, so they stay in renters. When you have more renters and demand still gets, gets strong and continues going strong, rental prices are going to go up, up, and up, and up, and up. I own an investment property down 5th Street Extended. And this particular property, over the course of its, over the course of its existence, has increased in rental monthly value depending on the landlord, four to seven percent every year since I've owned it in 2008. High home prices, high home values, 
that limit people from purchasing their house for the first time are synonymous with high rental prices. If you cannot buy a house for the first time, you stay in the rental game. And as more people are priced out of first time home buyership, they stay into the rental game. And as more people stay in the rental game, that added competition drives rental prices up for capitalistic landlords that are not wrong. They have mortgages to pay, sons and daughters to feed, husband and wives to keep happy, and are looking to do the right thing themselves, landlords, by creating generational wealth for their next of kin. It's a domino effect that is vicious, Darwinistic. It's a domino effect that if you were going to consider the plains and deserts and prairies of Africa, it's a domino effect that's synonymous with the king of the jungle pursuing its prey. And that's called capitalism. So council's got to ask themselves this question, my friends. If we allow more ADUs, cottages, basement apartments, or if we allow Susie and Johnny homeowner in Greenbrier, in Belmont, in North Downtown, in Fifeville, on Rugby Ave, Rose Hill Drive, Preston Heights, Prospect, Orangedale, and we allow Susie and Johnny to pivot their homes from single family detached structures that are only for one family and evolve them into duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, granny suites, cottages in the backyards, and basement apartments. Does that additional supply create affordability. If we uptick the opportunities for people to rent, you create more spaces for people to live from a rental standpoint. The additional supply of rental rooftops should potentially lower the price of rent in the city, which would create more disposable income in the pockets of renters that they can squirrel and save for home ownership eventually. On paper, the idea makes sense. You've got to ask yourself, how many of the pieces of property that go on the market, what percentage will be purchased and scooped up by enterprising, entrepreneurial, capitalistic, business-focused developers, landlords, remodelers, and people in the house flipping game. Do I say a large percentage of that? No. I don't think a large percentage will be. Do I say a small percentage? Much closer to the small percentage than the large percentage, but still it's going to happen. The future land use map is the best path possible at least that I've seen, to making the affordability index more approachable and manageable. And I understand that there are homeowners that are watching this program. I'm a homeowner. Real estate investor. And I've worked my I was going to use a profanity. I've worked my buns off for 13 plus years, 60, 70, 80 hours, 80, 90 hours a week, one vacation in 13 years. Because A, I love what I do, but B, because I want to leave a legacy for my son, provide for my family. And I'm ambitious from what I want from a resource standpoint for myself, my wife, and my kid, and my extended family. So I put in the effort. 
I don't feel guilty for being successful, not in the least. I will never, ever, ever regret or feel guilt for earning income, never. You work your ass off, you get paid for the value of that time. That's the way it should be. You get up at 5, 5.15 in the morning, and you start working when most folks are just getting out of bed and drinking a cup of coffee, and you've already set out a couple of contracts, you should be rewarded for that effort. Your mind's working 24-7, 365 on business. You should be rewarded for that effort. I will never, ever, ever feel guilty for earning income or being successful. Neither should you. And as homeowners, I understand your trepidation with how added density may impact the value of your house. I understand that. As homeowners, I understand your trepidation as added density may impact your quality of life. Traffic, schools, car, traffic uh, being too uh, congested, schools being too crowded. Parking spaces on the side of the road. Take the Belmont neighborhood, being a thing of the past. You ever try to park? You ever try to patronize one of the fantastic eateries in Belmont? The local, Tavola, Mas Tapas. And you ever try to go there on a Friday or Saturday evening and park your car? It's difficult to find a space. Now imagine if you were the homeowner on Graves, on Little Graves, on Goodman and you were getting home from busting your tail for 12 hours. And you get to your house on a Friday or Saturday night and you can't park your car in front of your house because some folks want some bacon wrapped dates. Some folks want the uh, pasta bolognese or a bocadillo. That would irritate you. I get it. I get it, and I empathize. But I can assure you, I can assure you, the downfall of no diversity, the downfall of no eclectic thought, the downfall of a homogenous community, the collateral damage is much more significant than a Ford Explorer, a Mercedes Benz, a Kia electric vehicle, a Toyota Tacoma, parked in front of your house on Grave Street on a Friday or Saturday night. And for the homeowners that are watching the program, I'm one, I'm a real estate investor, I'm mindful of home values and portfolio values, and I'm mindful and concerned about how increased density is gonna impact valuations, very much so. I'm going to offer a word of encouragement. The cost of goods for new construction, the supply chain throttleization, the pinched nature of supply chains associated with subcontractors, there's not enough of them to work on projects. Try getting a plumber, a painter, an electrician, a mason, a handyman, a roofer, a drywall guy. Try getting a, a granite or cabinet guy to come immediately to do a job for you. 
Unless you know somebody, it's not going to happen for some time. You're going to wait. You're going to wait, and you're going to wait some more. Because the cost of goods, lumber, drywall, granite, toilets, appliances, hardwood flooring, because they're going through the roof from an expense standpoint, and remember, everything's associated with fuel, as gasoline upticks cent after cent after cent after cent at the tanks, that additional cost is passed to you, the consumer. So what could have been cost of goods associated with $1.90 in gas per gallon during the middle of COVID when no one's driving, those same cost of goods are now associated with $3.40 in gas today. That $1.50 delta per gallon is passed to you, the consumer, from additional cost of goods, groceries, and cost of goods from a new construction standpoint. Why I say this to you, and why I pass this along to you, these new construction elements, whether it's the single family detached that's newly constructed into a duplex, or the single family detached that's newly constructed into a quadplex, or the newly constructed cottage in the backyard, that's gonna cost so much damn money to do that work. The trickle over impact is increased valuations for your homes. You build a new home on Goodman, you build a new home on Locust, you build a new home on Carroll Creek and Glenmore, all the homes that are existing construction on, on Goodman, on Locust, on Carroll Creek will uptick in value because those newly constructed houses cost so much money to develop. So I'm not buying the decrease in home valuations associated with density. And my jury is still out on quality of life impacts with added density. Additional people means more tax base. More tax base means more money for local government to allocate to schools, to building a brand. And the situation, the problem, the conundrum, the dilemma that's in front of us today, when it's all said and done, it's a good one. It comes down to this. Are you ready? People want to live here. They want to raise their family here. They want to spend generations here. They want to call Charlottesville and Central Virginia and Albemarle County their home. That's a good thing. You know what the alternative is? Martinsville, Southwestern Virginia, parts of West Virginia, afterthought communities associated with coal mines or trains or communities once stops on the James River. People want to live here. It's a good problem. People want to live here. Now, we just need to empathetically and strategically and purposely manage that demand in the most equitable fashion for our constituents. That's what we got to do. It starts tonight, this evening. Esta noche.
stay open-minded to the future land use map and increase density. Change is a hard pill to swallow. But this pill we're swallowing may in fact be vitamin C and vitamin D that is good for the soul and the heart, the body that we call Charlottesville and Central Virginia. few other topics I'd like to get off my chest today on the I Love Seville show. And I truly, truly enjoy connecting with you guys through this platform. I went to the grocery store yesterday and I was utterly sticker shocked with prices. The increased cost in groceries are undoubtedly impacting our citizens and residents that are already living on the margin. That disposable income to pay for the added grocery costs has got to come from somewhere. Be empathetic for this, to this, please. A couple of other items. Notre Dame beat UVA like a drum on Saturday night, like the little drummer boy. It was ugly. We saw the value of Brennan Armstrong, who could be the most valuable player to any team in college football. Without Brennan Armstrong, it looked like It looked like the Kansas City Chiefs were playing the little giants of the Thomas Jefferson Youth Football League. We hope, we pray, we cross our fingers that Mr. Armstrong, the ginger Southpaw gunslinger, can go against Pittsburgh and Virginia Tech because if the Wahoos win the last two games of the season, they are doing the merengue, the salsa, the tango, and the ACC championship. We're still in the driver's seat. I watched Brennan Armstrong warm up before the game. And the way he was throwing the football was gingerly at best. He was wincing in pain every time he would throw the football to a pass catcher in warm ups. And he was not zipping it, he was just lobbing it in the air. Do I think he's going to be 100% against Pittsburgh? No way, Jose. Do I even think he's going to play against Pittsburgh right now on a Monday? I would say the odds are against him playing against the Pitt Panthers. Broken ribs for a quarterback? Good God. Broken ribs for a football player who gets pounded in the chest every single play? Jesus, that's something that could impact him from a health standpoint long term. Collapsed lungs? Virginia basketball got a much needed victory against Radford. The Wahoos while they are out of the top 25 and we are not accustomed to seeing Bennett's boys out of the top 25, I see promise and potential on this roster. I would love to see a third scorer slowly step up. Mr. Gardner and Mr. Franklin, the ECU transfer Gardner, the Indiana transfer Franklin are our best scorers and players and it's not even close. Whether it's the big man Shedrick, whether it's the Second year, Reese Beekman, we need a third scorer to take the load off of Gardner and Franklin. I don't think that third scorer is going to be Kihei. I don't think that third scorer is going to be Cody Statman. They've had enough time, and it's not going to be Kafaro. They've had enough time to prove their worth. A third scorer is paramount to the success of this team. And lastly, to close the program, a little bit of business that's going to certainly be reflected here in Central Virginia, Restaurant Brands International, the parent company of Burger King, purchased Firehouse Subs. The sandwich chain has 1,200 locations across the U.S. Restaurant Brands stock is upticking today. Burger King somewhat an afterthought in the fast food wars. Now has a reputable sandwich brand and firehouse subs in its brand portfolio. We'll see how that impacts Charlottesville and Central Virginia. My name is Jerry Miller. This, the I Love Seville Show, where friends, I love connecting with you through this platform. I dearly, dearly do. Thank you kindly for joining us on a glorious Tuesday to be above the mud. Take care.